This morning, we will be looking at Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 15 through 23. We will probably finish it up this morning, the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> um, maybe not, but we'll look at it uh, maybe next week, and then we'll get back into uh, the Galilean ministry of Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 23. Have you ever eaten a, a fruit, uh, maybe a peach, that just uh, tasted so good? You ever have one of those peaches and you're just like, wow, it's just sweet, it's watery, it just gets all over your hands and you're just like licking it up because it's just a good peach. When Virginia and I lived in Roland Heights, we lived off of Los Palacios Road there, which was just off of Fullerton in, in, in Roland Heights and the 60 Freeway. We had a fruit tree that was a peach tree be, in, in our backyard. And this thing just gave huge peaches and they were just so delicious. You just knew, you just knew that um, you were in heaven when you had one of those peaches. You ever have a rotten peach? <laughs> the same is true. You know that it is a rotten peach and you just kind of spit it out of your mouth and throw it into the, the trash can. The same is true of Jesus, you know. You know you have Jesus when life is just sweet with him, when he just satisfies you. It just seems like you've died and you've gone to heaven because Jesus is right there with you and everything is going to be okay because he's there. But the same is true when you're in a false religious system like Islam, like the Mormons, like Jehovah's, when it's just bitter Something's not right. There just seems to be a work. Something's just off. Something just doesn't make any sense to us. And you want to just throw it away. You just want to get rid of it. And you want to find the true Jesus. And so this morning's theme is on deception. Deception. I thought it was important for me as an individual when I got saved to look into what Christianity is all about. I was raised Catholic. Never set a foot in a Christian church. And so all of a sudden I get saved. I'm born again. My life is changing. I'm reading the Bible. And now I'm introduced to this Christianity, to Calvary Chapel, to Baptist, to Methodist, to Lutheran, to faith, uh, a faith movement, uh, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness. Uh, at, at that time, I was actually really good friends, my wife and I, with this family that were Mormons. And we were going a lot over to their house and, and, and enjoying their fellowship and marriage uh, uh, fellowship that they would have. And we were slowly being uh, drawn into that. And so I felt that it was important that, that I find out about what Christianity is about, what Mormonism is about. What are these other religious faiths? I would listen to Greg Laurie. I would listen to uh, AM radio and hear some of the Southern Baptists, J. Vernon McGee. I'd also listen to faith teachers, the screaming and the old, the old time Pentecostal preachers, you know, that they just scream and they yell, the Lord, you know, and you just go, yeah, come on, preach it, brother, preach it, you know, and they just, they get you and they motivate you. And so I would listen to all of that. Uh, those are like, God wants you healthy. He wants you wealthy. He, he wants you healed in the name of Jesus. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. But there was a point where I asked myself, which way is the right way? Which way is the right way? Because I think that's important. Here, here I'm leaving a religious system and I'm going into something new, different to me. I want to make sure I'm going into the right thing. Uh, years later, uh, I was really challenged in my faith just because of the struggles and the trials that started coming into my life. And I thought, maybe I chose the wrong way. And I started questioning my relationship with Jesus Christ and this whole Christianity thing. And it was the fact that I did enough research into Catholicism and all these other, what they call uh, cults, which would be Mormonism, Jehovah Witnesses. Anything that has Christ in it is considered a cult. And also occult, which would be more demonic. Uh, so you have a place like uh, Islam or um, Baha'i faith, uh, Buddha. Those would be more of occult uh, type of uh, uh, religions and so forth. And so I did enough uh, research that I realized that no, 
Uh, this is the word of God from beginning to end, and I have done enough and read enough uh, of this book to know that I haven't found one error, and if there was an error, it was my error in misreading it or not understanding it. In, in 30 years, I still uh, go through the word of God, and I don't find any errors at all, and I compare it to Christianity, and I see that it aligns. There's some variations within Christianity. I, I totally understand that, whether you baptize sub- merge or whether you sprinkle and you know various things like that but the foundation is is definitely there and so we need to understand this so that we're equipped so we know what we believe and we can hang on to it uh, with our dear lives and so this morning's theme is as I said is deception in verses 15 through 20 we're going to look at the good and and bad teaching or wolves in sheep's clothing we find in these verses that Jesus teaches us about false prophets, uh, which are easily distinguishable by their works, or you could say by their actions, just as righteous people can be identified by their works and their actions, though they are so closely uh, aligned that the deception can be very subtle, that you can miss it. And and that's what I want to really touch on. So let's go ahead and read the text 15 through 20, and and we'll get into it. Beware of false prophets. Now, this is Jesus speaking to us. These are his words. He thinks that it's important enough to warn us of these things. Uh, Today, you don't get a whole lot of warning uh, from these different religions. We're to more embrace and accept the differences and be tolerant and so forth. But Jesus here is very clear to his disciples, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. Now, it seems here from Jesus' words that we are literally to become fruit inspectors. We're not to judge, and we saw Jesus share with us about the plank and the speck and how we judge righteously and gently and lovingly to restore. And yet here he's saying, look, there are men out there that will deceive you, that will profess to know me, and they will give you a word, but you are to judge them. You are to be fruit inspectors. You are to look at their lives, you are to look at their words, you are to look at their actions and their works, and you are to have a sound judgment concerning them. Now this is important enough that Jesus writes it down in several places in scriptures. Uh, We saw it back in in verse 16 of this chapter, where he says, "You, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or thistles? Figs from thistles, even so every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And then in Luke 6, 43, it says, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. And then in chapter 12 of Matthew, it says, Neither make the tree good or its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Then he goes on and says, Brood of vipers, and he's speaking to the religious leaders, How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasures brings forth evil things. I I think when you look at those scriptures, uh, what Jesus is saying here to summarize is that when you have a good man, a a good religious faith, that there are going to be good fruits that come out and there's going to be evidence. But when you have a bad man, in a bad religious sense, that the evidence eventually will show that they're bad. You can't hide it that long. You know, I I have learned in the 30 years that to get to know someone, you have to have a relationship with them for at least two to three years. Two to three years. 
just so that they get comfortable enough to then all of a sudden tell you who they really are. Because we have this um, mechanism in us that when we first meet someone, we want to give a good impression of ourselves. You know, we want to become friends. We want to be, be uh, known as someone that's, that's good and gentle and kind and all those good things. But then as we get to know each other and we start to see each other's flaws and that we're not as good and gentle as, as we thought we were and so forth, and all of a sudden we let our guards down and then all of a sudden comes out the true nature of the individual. Uh, first of all, let me tell you that we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, and so it doesn't surprise me at all when someone says something mean or hateful. It doesn't surprise me when someone doesn't keep their word and make their yeses yes and their noes no. It doesn't surprise me at all because we're all sinners and fall short of the glory of word. And men are going to fail men. And so it doesn't surprise me. What does surprise me is that we take that position in view of others that we don't see it in ourselves. And so then we become self-righteous and we end up leaving the church and not working through problems. We, we end up hurting the body of Christ by dividing it and so forth because of deception and not willing to look at ourselves. And I've seen that more than anything else. The context here is in line with verses 13 and 14 that we looked at last week concerning the narrow gate and the broad way that leads to destruction. You remember that? And so Jesus is, is bringing these two together, that there is a broad way, and this broad way is led by false prophets. And there's a narrow way, and that narrow way is, is, is led by those teachers that are uh, good teachers and have good fruits. And we are to judge which way is best for us. And I think really that's the key, right? Which way is best for you? Do you want truth, or do you want a candy-covered false truth? that makes you feel good, that makes you kind of skip as you walk, you know, but hey, life is good anyway, and, and God's going to bless me, and everything's going to be okay, and so forth, you know, without the repentance, without the uh, confronting of sin, with, without dealing with relationships, and so forth, you know, it's up to you, which way do you want, and if you're going in the wrong way, if you're going in the wrong way, oftentimes you're being misled that way, and it's probably more than likely a book, a leader of a church, a TV evangelist of some sort that's leading you down the wrong path. Jesus warns and prophesied of these false teachers throughout scriptures. Let me give you a, a few more references. In Matthew 24, 11, he says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. So this is a prophetic word right there. They're gonna come. They will be here. They're here already. And they will be here in the future. And so you have to understand the word of God. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible. So these false teachers, these false prophets, they'll actually do signs and wonders before you. They'll do miracles and you're going to go, wow, this must be God. And you're going to follow after them. See, that doesn't impress me at all to do a miracle, to do a sign, to give a healing because the enemy can do that. What impresses me is what truth are you giving out and how is your life changed by that truth? That's what impresses me, not the miracles. You can, you can actually say that someone is, is, is very good at doing something. That doesn't impress me. You can be the, the greatest speaker. You can be the greatest worker in the church. It doesn't impress me. It's what you teach and how you live it that impresses me. Philippians 3, 2 says, Beware of dogs, evil, <clears throat> uh, evil workers. Beware of false circumcision. Now he's talking about the religious leaders of that time, the Jews. They were Judaizers. They wanted to bring men back under the law. And again, uh, Paul there was saying, beware. They're dogs. They're evil workers. And you're to beware of them. Peter said in 2 Peter 2, 1, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who will strictly bring in damnable heresies. Heresies are false teachings. Even denying the Lord that brought them and bringing upon themselves swiss destruction Peter said now that's interesting that Peter says that Paul had to confront Peter because Peter was actually entertaining some of the religious legalizers 
He was agreeing with them that, yeah, okay, uh, maybe they should get circumcised too. And, and he was kind of approving of following the law a little bit. And Paul had to come and said, Peter, Peter, wait a minute, stop. You know better than that. You know that it's by grace that we're saved and it's through faith only and it's not some work that we can perform to add to it, Peter. And he corrected Peter and yet Peter here is warning us now, not just false prophets, but false teachers who will bring in teaching that will damn your soul. They're going to mislead you. And of course he says that they will also be damned. Now who are these false teachers today? Because we want to know who they are today, right? Does anyone want to list you know, so that you know, stay away from these people. I mean, I would love to give you a list. I can name them right off to you, many of them in, in my head. I'm not going to do that. I think that their characteristics that Jesus is going to share with us here will let you know who they are. To give you one example of a false teacher, and, and maybe you're going to get really upset at me, but I would have to say, or a false prophet, I would have to say is Joel Olstein. Joel Olstein. So many people love that guy. He, he is a great speaker. He tells the greatest jokes right before he speaks. And every message is very positive, very motivating, and it gets your, your, your right foot forward, you know, and you get moving. But there's no substance. There's no repentance. There, there, there's no Jesus in there. There's no conversion to Christianity, you know, with the right repentive heart. There's no born again, you know, in there. He leaves out a lot of substance there. Now, I'm not saying that he's not saved. I don't know his heart, but I know what he teaches is not correct in the sense that he doesn't teach everything. He doesn't teach everything. He wants to just pull out love and just talk about love the whole time and that's not the full counsel of God that's one guy I know uh, I'll give you one more and it for the since I gave you the guys but I'll, I'll give you the the ladies there's, there's there's a famous lady her name is Joyce Myers also Paula White also great teachers great orators but I've heard them say and believe in faith that their words, our words have power. We can actually create with our words if we have enough faith. That's false. Only God can create. I, I remember watching uh, Joyce Myers one time, and she actually said, if, if you had enough faith, you could put money in your wallet. It would just be there. You open it, and it'd be there, and you could just use it for God's glory, of course. Great speaker, great motivational speaker. I hear a lot of Christians quote her. I see it all over the, uh, Facebook and so forth. But look into what I'm saying, look into these people, and you will see that there's, there is some poison underlined in their teaching. Now, we can determine who they are by what Jesus said, though. They are those who perform prophecies. Now, prophecies are prophetic words. Uh, if you watch TBN from time to time, uh, there's a battle going on between some of these uh, ministers that are way up there. They want to outperform the other minister. And so what they'll do is they'll have prophecies. Uh, they'll come on stage and they'll do a, a big old hoopla. And, and they'll start by saying, the Lord has spoken to me. And he has a word for you that this year is a year of abundance. And it's abundance for a lot of you here. And you mark my words, it's a year of abundance, of repentance, and so forth. And, and he prophesies that the year, not just for you, but the, for the church and, and for America. And then the other one will then all of a sudden hear that, like, oh, well, I, I got to somehow outdo that. And they'll come in and they'll do the same thing. And then if you just wait for a year, you realize it wasn't such a good year after all. That's false prophecy, that's falsehood, that's lies. The fact that it doesn't come true means it's not from God. And they do that constantly. So they perform prophecies. Casting out demons. Benny Hinn. Psh, you know, with a wave of a hand, whew, crowds just fall over. Uh, some believe that that's uh, through hypnotism. Uh, that, that, that he somehow has the ability to, to get people to focus on him. And then by his movements, by his words and so forth, they're kind of like in a trance. And then he just... Whew, they all fall over. You know, uh, healings uh, of, uh, of all so sorts, whether demonic or whether there are other healings. Another is performing great signs and wonders. I remember I, I watched, again, Benny Hinn. Uh, he has healing crusades, right? 
I remember we were going to a men's conference and his crusade was the night before the men's conference, Calvary Chapel men's conference in Anaheim. Someone brings out this little boy who had this disease. It was a rare disease that made him inflamed. So his hands were just huge and inflamed. His face was inflamed. And they rolled him over to Benny Hinn. And Benny Hinn says, oh, bring him over. Bring him. Starts praying, praying for him. And oh, the Lord's going to heal him. The Lord's going to heal him. And then he's he praying over him. Get up, boy, get up. Okay, not yet. Praying. And then he runs over here and he starts talking to the crowd. And says, okay. And he looks at the boy again. He comes back over, does it again. Three times. Every time he walked over, they had pulled the boy further away. And the next thing you know is the boy's out of the picture and he's talking to a crowd and another person falls down and gets healed and another person and all of a sudden you don't hear about the boy anymore because he couldn't heal him. He couldn't heal him because he doesn't really have the gift of healings. It's all probably planned or people feel like they're better but then they go home and they're just as sick. Uh, signs and miracles. Those who say God wants you healthy and wealthy. Does God want you wealthy? I believe to a certain degree if he's called you to be wealthy, you're going to use it for his glory. Does he want you healthy? I, I think that he does from time to time. He wants us healthy and wealthy to uh, minister and to share with his body. But does he want that for everyone? No, not everyone is wealthy and not everyone is healthy. But there's enough in the scriptures that tell you that there are some that are rich and they have certain responsibilities. And it does tell you that some are sick, like Timothy was sick, and he had to be given a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake. And so uh, there's a balance there. But they go to an extreme. They go to an extreme. Uh, there had been a couple that had come here, and they came out of the faith movement, the wealthy uh, faith movement. And they came here, and they started pushing this, the doctrine. They wanted me to start teaching a little bit more on tithing and giving and, and uh, receiving back a tenfold, a hundredfold, a, you know, and so forth. And if you give more, then you'll receive more. And I said, I don't do that. Unless it comes up in the scriptures, I will not talk about money every Sunday morning. And so uh, we started growing our relationship. And I kind of asked, I go, why are you guys here, though? I mean, this church is like nothing what you've come from. Why are you here? The reason they came here was because of the church that they went to, which was a faith church. They were making so much more money, they made them feel like they were nothing. They were nothing. And that's what it's all about, impressing other people. And that's not what Christianity is about. That's not what the wealth is about. And so they made them feel poor. And these people were very wealthy compared to our church. So you can imagine how wealthy the other people were with their Cadillacs and so forth. Now, those same who say they are the only way, those are also false prophets. Like Islam, uh, you, you listen to the news long enough, they're going to say, we're the only way, everyone else is going to hell. Christianity, unbeliever, unless you convert to Islam, you're going to hell. We're the only way, and we're going to one day rule this world. Um, <clears throat> again, another fruit uh, is you have to be baptized through them, and I mentioned that last time. And we'll see more on these false teachers as we go through. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and look at this, because this is an obstacle uh, to Christianity, and it's one that affects the body of Christ. Uh, periodically, we get people coming in, visiting the church, and they have roots in the faith movement uh, more than any other uh, movement at all, in the wealth movement, or even in the positive confession movement. Um, I know people that are, are very... Uh, much influenced by uh, Kenneth Copeland or Hagen and, and those ones there. So, <clears throat> And these false teachers are very deceptive and they're raising up deceiving people. So let's look at these wolves in sheep clothing. Verse 15, beware, Jesus says, be alert, be watchful. This is a command. I, I felt that God was calling me to be an apologetic, uh, defending the faith by uh, revealing what the other faiths believed. But I just wanted to, to really know what they believed so that, so that I knew that I was in the right faith, that I was going the right way, I was in the narrow path, and it just seemed like, yeah, it has to be, because I get more opposition this way than I do the other way, just receiving, uh, you know, much more uh, cooper uh, cooperation just because it's so much broader compared to just being so narrow-minded. So beware of false prophets. Now, false prophets were ones that said, I'm speaking to you from God. God has given me a word, and this word is for you. Well, you know what? God can speak to me. He doesn't have to speak to you so that you could speak to me. Let God speak to me if he wants to speak to me. It's simple as that. And it goes for the same for you too. 
I am not a prophet, and I'm not going to say God told me to tell you at all. I'm never going to do that because I don't believe that God's telling me to do that. And I don't think that you should expect the pastor to tell you what God is saying. You should be on your knees praying, seeking the Lord, and asking Him to speak to you and give you direction and so forth. Today, we don't need that. We need it in the Old Testament. We need it in the New Testament. The New Testament is now written. And so there's no need for us to have prophets. I would say Pastor Chuck was a prophet, but not in the sense of the old and the new. He was a different kind of prophet, a good Bible teaching prophet. Also, a false prophet is one who contradicts the Bible. Uh, That's why it is so important that you read your Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Know it, understand it, and in this way you will not be deceived. They are people who claim to speak on God's behalf, who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now that's interesting. Think of a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, they're disguised. And you see these pictures of these wolves and they have sheep's clothing all over, but their teeth are are huge and their fangs are sticking out and they're growling at you and so forth. And that's the picture that he gives there. It's to portray an innocence. But underneath and in the heart, there's some wickedness there. But on the outside, it's portrayed as innocence, a gentle, lowly little sheep. You know, it's almost impossible to know who they are because they're so gentle, they're so kind, they're so generous, and you can be deceived so easily by them. Think of Judas Iscariot. Did the disciples know that he was the one that would betray Jesus? No. You remember, they even were were wondering when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they were like, is it me? (laughs) They thought it was them before they even thought it was Judas. That's how subtle it is. That's how deceptive it is. Not once did I read that Judas said, is it me, Lord? He probably already knew it was him. It was already in his heart. But he was able to keep it under disguise as a sheep. He was in charge of the treasury. And they knew that there was money missing. But yet, Judas continued on as though nothing was going on. Very deceptive, very uh, self-centered position that he had there. But he says here, inwardly, they are ravenous wolves, ravenous wolves. Uh, They are ravenous wolves, which are animals with an insatiable appetite. They really have a motive. They have a purpose, and it's all self-centered. Jesus gives this image of this false prophet so that you cannot forget it. A a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, Wolves in sheep's clothing describe anyone who disguises uh, themselves from really who they are inside. They, they could have a mean nature, but they can be so composed, so calm, and so gentle. But inside, they're ravenous wolves waiting for the opportunity to, to seize upon people. Some of the meanest people have the calmest spirits. You ever meet them? They're very subtle. Uh, some of the meanest ladies that you don't want to deal with are very calm and they know how to manipulate and plan things to destroy. Those are wolves in sheep's clothing and you have to be aware of them. So this is a great picture of those religious leaders uh, even of Jesus' days who had denied and even distorted the truth. You look at the the acts uh, of the religious leaders, uh, the ultimate fruit of them, and, and you can see where their heart really is. Now, there's nothing wrong with testing these spirits. Uh, we should test the spirits of people, of pastors, of ministries. We should find out about them. Chuck has always taught that if you're going to invest and give to support a ministry, uh, you need to know that the Spirit of God is there and moving in that ministry before you do so. There's a little story of a great religious leader who was teaching his followers in the jungle of India. And a devotee uh, that was around were listening to him. And as he taught uh, there about reality and and how everything is relative and and there's a, a great illusion. And what's really real to us is not real, but it is an illusion. And so we're living in this great illusion and it, it, it's this uh, reality that, that's really not there. And so as he's sharing this with his disciples, this stampede of wild elephants come 
running into this whole group and they all start getting up and running all over the place, including this teacher, jumps into the tree, climbs up, and there's a pupil with him. And the pupil says, sir, I thought that everything was an illusion. I mean, all these elephants came running at us. Why did we all run, including you, and jump in the tree? And the teacher looks at him and says, what elephants? What elephants? See, it's just so contradictory, and yet people buy into that. What elephants? Oh, so there were no elephants. Okay, I think I get it, you know. And so they stick with it. Come on, use common sense, you know. The elephants that just came in there that just contradict his teaching of reality. That's how blatant and clear it is to some of us, but we just don't want to give it up. I find that the hardest people to reach are the people that are in, in, in these uh, cultic groups that know it's wrong, but they don't get out of it because they know a lot of people. They have friends and family there, and so they just don't want to leave. That happens quite often. One way to determine whether a man is false, a false prophet is to watch the emphasis on money, and we've, we've spoken a little bit about that, on material things. And, and you'll notice that it's all focused on themselves. It's about how rich they are, how wealthy they are, how much faith they have, and so forth, and not on God. It's always about merchandise and how they can use other people for their own interests. Peter, 2 Peter 2, 3 says, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. And so uh, judgment's coming for these false teachers. Now, verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The fruit will be evident. Uh, we are to be fruit inspectors. Um, how do you tell a fruit is ready? Uh, there are some fruit you can't tell uh, really easy, like a watermelon. How do you tell a watermelon is, is ready to, to eat? It's hard. You know, some say you're supposed to push the belly button on the end there, and if it's got some movement, maybe it's ready. Some say you knock on it. If you hear a hollow sound, maybe it's ready. I mean, who knows? You can tell a peach is ready. You start squeezing it a little bit or an avocado, and you can kind of figure out when a fruit is ready or not, right? Or, or, or how about a, a bad fruit? You know, you, you, you pick up an orange and it just squishes in your hand. You go, ooh, I don't even want to open that one. You just know. And so we are to be fruit inspectors. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So it gives you this picture. How, how do you get grapes from thorn bushes? You, you don't. It's, it's that evident. It's that clear. Or figs from thistles. You just, you don't get that. And, and these are questions that Jesus is asking that demand a no. You don't get it. It's very clear. It's not like, oh, let me think about that one. No, I, yeah, I think you can. I think you can. Well, if we cross-pollinate and, and graft in, that, that, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, but it takes manipulation to do so. You know, you, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but most fruit trees that you have on your property are not the actual fruit tree of an orange. They're just a trunk of another tree, and they graft the orange tree branch into it and then once it grabs then that branch is what gives you the fruit that's how they do it today and so you can have you can act that's why you can have a tree that has multiple fruits on it there's some trees that, that give you uh, various fruits but that's man manipulated fruit that's deception that jesus is talking about and so one of the tests that we can uh, test of a true prophet is one of obedience to god's doctrine that's where the test really lies is how obedient are they to the doctrine of God how obedient is Joel Osteen to the doctrine of God not very not very he's not giving us uh, the full counsel of God uh, <clears throat> now Jesus is going to move from branches to trees here and, and this imagery of fruit to the quality of it as I just mentioned so he says in verse 17 even so every good tree bears good fruit and so if you're a good tree you will bear good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit no doubt about it if one is true for a good tree then the other is also true that it will be bad fruit a good tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit i like what job said 14:4. who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean thing and so if you're already corrupt how are you going to give good counsel how are you going to teach the word of God? You just can't. Only God can take an unclean thing and make it clean. He can cause it to be born again. 
like we saw in the video there, where that woman went from one extreme faith and, and gave her life to Christ, and immediately after saying that it was Jesus that she prayed to, it changed her whole life. Only God can do that. The Spirit of the Lord uh, moves in the heart of an individual, and they are born again. But can a man whose heart is corrupt make it clean? He can only hold up an image for so long, for so long. Everyone knows that individual because it's that clear. Look at verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he brings back that visual picture there uh, of <clears throat> the narrow way and the broad way. And the broad way leads to what? Destruction to hell. And so that's what he's talking about here. That tree that brings bad fruit eventually will be cut down. Imagine owning a, a crop of orange trees. And a third of those crop are bad trees. What do you do with those trees? You cut them down. First of all, that's good land that they're on, and you need to utilize that land. Secondly, they might have a disease, and you're going to give it to the other trees, and now you're going to lose the other two-thirds, and so you've got to cut it off. You've got to cut it off. And so every bad tree, you need to cut it away. One of my responsibilities as a pastor is to watch over the soul's of those that God has given to me here. Now, I know I have a limited, res a limited responsibility because of the recipient, that is you, because we live in America, we have free will, uh, we can choose where we go and not go, and we can come and go whenever we please. And, and that's, that's wonderful, and that's great. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that's what God wants of us. I believe that we actually live in the kingdom of God and not in America. America is where we are sojourning, but we live in the kingdom of God, and within that kingdom of God, we are part of the body of Christ, every one of us, and God has put you in this part of the body of Christ. And if you have seen my fruit, and if you have seen the fruit here in this church, you will see that it's one based upon the word of God, and if God is calling you here, then I think God is also calling you to stick it out here, and not to be jumping from place to place, or somewhere else, then stick it out there, and, and stay there, and get active, and get connected in there. But if someone comes in with deceptive uh, teachings, with bad fruit, then I am to confront that so that it doesn't spread like cancer. I need to deal with it so that the body of Christ is not harmed by it. And there has from time to time where I have neglected my responsibility and allowed someone because of grace that maybe they'll change, maybe they'll stop, and, and usually they'll leave and they'll take about four or five families with them. And that's not what God wants. That's not God's will. That's deception, that's division, um, and that is totally wrong. And that's what I am supposed to protect the body of Christ from. Now, I totally understand, and people come and go all the time as they're looking for churches and so forth. We just had uh, some people uh, that were here, and um, they had their ideas of what and how things were supposed to be run. And, and they assured me that they were struggling with it, and they weren't sharing anything with anyone. And I said, okay, wonderful, great. Let's try to work through this, you know, and let, we'll figure out how to work through this and so forth. And they just weren't willing to do that. And so they didn't, ended up leaving. And they lied to me because several people said, where's so-and-so? And then when I said, though, they finally left, they're like, oh, good, because they just complained. I'm like, wait a minute, they told me they didn't speak to anybody, so they lied to me. Those are the ones where you just want to let them go because they're just going to continue to destroy the body of Christ. And so if, you're along, if you are a part of those type of groups, don't be because you're only hurting yourself. You really are. We're going to continue on. I've been here for 30 years. We'll continue on. We might be small, but we'll continue on. You'll go and you'll still be floating around trying to find a place that's going to accept what you believe. And you'll always do that because you're not willing to say, hey, I'm submitted to the leadership here because it's good leadership. And they're fair, and they're sincere, and there's fruit here. And I'm submitted to that leadership. And so I'm willing to stick it out and grow together in that ministry. This is how we protect the body of Christ. But when it's rotten and it's bad, no, you get rid of it. And so Jesus says, therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. In other words, it is very clear that you will know them by their fruit. Now he comes to verse 21 through 23. And we see the way into the kingdom, or maybe not the way into the kingdom. And it's, it's famous scripture, so we'll run through it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, verse 21, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, underline that, 
He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, this is interesting. The key is who does the will of the Father. That's the key in these three verses. If the key is not saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do signs and wonders? As I mentioned to you, all these false prophets and false teachers have done these things. What's important is what? Have they done the will of the Lord? Have they been obedient to God? Have they been obedient to the word of God? What was it in Samuel? Um, King David, uh, Samuel said uh, concerning Saul, and his relationship to the Lord in 1522. If you want to look it up for Samuel 1522, Samuel said to, to Saul, he says, has not the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? In other words, do you think the Lord has this great delight in your offerings and your sacrifices? No, he has more delight in your obedience to him. He'd rather have obedience to the Lord. Uh, there's a story of two sons who were asked to do things. And one son said, no, I'm not doing it. And then he changed his mind and he did it. The another son says, yeah, I'll do it, dad. Don't worry about it. But then he never does it. Which boy was right? The one that ended up doing it. That's the one that God has delight in. He might be a little rebellious in the beginning, say, no, I'm not going to do that. But then understanding that, hey, it's the right thing to do. I should do it. So then they go and do it because they have a good heart. Compared to the boy that's deceptive. Oh, yeah, I'll do it. Don't worry. I, I got it, buddy. Oh, no, no, no. You, you can depend on me. And then psh, they're gone. And, and you can't depend on them. It's obedience that God is looking for. In fact, if you go on and read in verse 23, it says, For rebellion or disobedience is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. So you can knock on the door and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done these things? That's not what God is looking for. He's looking for obedience to his word. Are you born again? Have you accepted Jesus Christ into your heart? Have you submitted to his will? Have you truly repented, turned from your old life? and now are walking a new life with him? Yeah, it's hard, and it's a struggle. I understand that. But that is the commitment that we have to Jesus Christ because he committed himself on the cross for us. He will say to those, I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. I had no knowledge of you. I don't recognize you because all you do is say, 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 but you really don't do my will. You're not really following my word. That's religion. It's not what God wants. Let me close here. If you call him Lord, how are you building your house? That's the question. How are you building your house? If he is your Lord, how are you building your house? What are you doing to build that house? Are you building it on the word of God? Or are you building it on some other foundation? Whose foundation is that that you're building it on? The words of these people were good words. Lord, I mean, we were prophesying in your name. We were casting out demons in your name. We were doing miracles in your name. People were getting healed. But they were living a lawless life. They were doing their own thing. You know who Paula White is? She's a really great speaker. I, I like her. And she's got this little, little <laughs> thing, you know, and, and the look. In the Lord, <laughs> so white little white girl, but she's been divorced, now remarried. Uh, you can go to her site, and she uh, expresses her materialism very highly. You, you, she wants you to know she's wealthy. She wants you to know she's a great dresser. She's good looking, and and all of this stuff. You just you go, wow, they live a lawless life, and yet they're professing to know the Lord. Someone may profess his faith in God and even invoke Jesus as Lord, but they deny him by their thoughts, their words, and their actions, their actions. There has to be true repentance, true repentance. How do you know when there's true repentance? 
by the fruit. <clears throat> they come to church and they're like, man, let me worship the Lord. I'm going to focus on him. I'm going to raise my hands. Lord Jesus, it's about you. And they're focused on him and nobody else because they want to get in contact with him. They want to hear from him. And then they're focused on the word. What, what are you saying to me today, Lord? How are you ministering to my spirit? What can I learn from you? How can you equip me for the work and for my family, Lord? Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you and your word. Have you truly repented? That's the call of God to every true believer, true repentance in the heart.